Hello everybody, this is Joe. I'm back to continue my discussion of Elaine Pagel's 1979 book, The Gnostic Gospels. I'm on chapter two, and chapter two is entitled um, One God, One Bishop, The Politics of Monotheism. So in the previous video or the previous chapter, I discussed a little bit about how um, Elaine Pagels envisions the the orthodoxy of the early Christian church to have finally won power over the Gnostic Christians and other types of Christians um, back before orthodoxy was established sometime in the fourth century. And one way that this was done according to Elaine Pagels is that by establishing strict boundaries to orthodoxy and creeds and things that you must believe in as opposed to others and defining what is orthodox and defining what is heresy. Um, you know, orthodox just means correct belief and defining what is incorrect belief. You can establish a political, you know, a, a, a power hierarchy with that. When you have boundaries and rules, you can do this. Well, Elaine Pagels continues with this theme and theorizes the idea, continues with this theme, and, and continues this theory that one of those rules that was established by the early Christian church was the idea of one God, one deity. Now, let's forget the Trinity for this time. I mean, this is before the, the Trinity, uh, you know, three persons and one God. Huh, huh, uh, uh, this is before that was kind of codified into orthodoxy. We're talking early second and mid third centuries, roughly around in there, when apologists, Christian apologists like Irenaeus and Ignatius and Tertullian, Ter Tertullian, Tertullian, that's kind of tough to say. Anyway, all of these Christian apologists pre-Nicene were arguing against Gnostic believers. Uh, or uh, that's another way of saying heretics. And a lot of what they were arguing was that they were establishing creeds like there is one God. And before Nag Hammadi, a lot of what we knew about Gnostic believers were because of people like these early Christian apologists, like Irenaeus. Irenaeus wrote this long book. Uh, it's, it was called something like Against All Heresies or something like that. I read the whole thing a long time ago, many years ago, and it's really interesting because he quotes a lot of these Gnostic believers like Valentinus, Gnostic theologians. And because he does that, we understand a lot of what they believe. And one of the things that they believed was the idea that there is more than one God. They, they were polytheists in a sense. Yes, Orthodox Christianity believes in one God, one, one God. Um, they established that Jews have believed in one God, although I, I'm convinced that, personally convinced that the Old Testament is a polytheistic document. Large chunks of it are, at least. Anyway, um, a lot of the Gnostic believers did believe in more than one deity. And a matter of fact, according to Irenaeus, uh, they, one of the deities they believe in is what we call the God of the Bible. Although, again, depending on how you define it, I think there is more than one God in the New Testament. Uh, I think the conception of God in the Gospel of John, for instance, is very different from the conception of the God, uh, of the, God the Father in the Gospel of Mark. Nonetheless, by the time we get to these Christian apologists of the third century, they are established in the idea of one God, as opposed to you Gnostic heretics like uh, Valentinus, who believe in our God too, but they believe that the God, the God of the New Testament, the God of the Bible, is actually a blind, stupid God. Yeah, he created the world. This God... <clears throat> whom they call the Demiurge, or, or is the creator of the world. I think that's what Demiurge actually means in some kind of some Coptic language. It means creator. 
Yeah, yeah, he created the physical world, but again, as, as I discussed last time, many Gnostic beliefs say or believe that the, the physical world is evil, just like the deity who created it. Evil, corrupt. And in order to in, in order to be an enlightened Gnostic, you have to transcend past this physical world, past that evil, malevolent, stupid, blind deity called the Demiurge who created this world. We have to transcend beyond all of that and to reach the actual spiritual realm of the divine whom we are now separated from and we don't know it. That's, that's the Gnostic beliefs. Now we knew all about all of this with Irenaeus and Ignatius and Tertullian and guys like that. So in a sense, this chapter was kind of disappointing because you really don't need Nag Hammadi uh, to discuss that these ideas have been around probably, or these theories about a monotheistic God being used to establish a power hierarchy in the church have been around probably for centuries. And I don't think Elaine Pagels came up with any of this as opposed to the previous chapter, which relied heavily on Nag Hammadi writings. In this chapter, she's citing Irenaeus and Tertullian mostly and using them to quote the Gnostic beliefs from Valentinus. Um, uh, she does manage to squeak in a little Nag Hammadi in the, in the first page of this chapter just as a way to... Um, to um, add additional evidence that, yeah, Irenaeus is right. <laughs> These Gnostic believers really did believe things like the God of the New Testament is uh, blind, stupid, and malevolent. So she quotes things like the, hy the, she quotes documents that were found in Nag Hammadi. Among them is a document which looks like a Gnostic sermon called the Hypostasis of the Archons. What a fantastic title. Um, uh, the, the divine power is, here's a quote, blind because his power and his ignorance and his arrogance, he said, it is I who am God. There is none other apart from me. And when he said this, he sinned against the entirety being the God above God. And a voice came forth from above the realm of absolute power saying, you are mistaken, Samael. Uh, Samael in Semitic languages means God of the blind. Not Samuel, Samael, God of the blind. Um, in other words, the deity who created this world, this physical world, is just blind and stupid and ignorant. Uh, she also quotes other Nag Hammadi documents like on the origin of the world and another one called the Secret Book of John, which essentially say the same thing. The deity who created this world is mad, blind, stupid, maybe even a little bit evil. Again, we have to transcend that deity because that deity created this physical world by definition being corrupt. So we have to transcend that. Now, one of the consequences of having, uh, according to Elaine Pagels anyway, is that one of the consequences of a, a Gnostic Christian who has beliefs in more than one God is that if you believe, let's say, in two deities, and if you have a church, a, an unstructured church hierarchy, which they did, Valentinus describes his church as being, um, you know, the believers would basically draw lots as to who's running the sermon next time. I, I, you know, they probably went into ecstatic, charismatic trances. A lot of the, a lot of the Gnostic documents write out you know, phonetically um, what we today call speaking in tongues. You know, they, they go into these ecstatic, uh, manic episodes where they do this and I think they just took turns doing this you know they would draw lots and take turns so how do you gain power when you're that unstructured well 
the Christian, uh, the Orthodox apologists, again, Irenaeus, Ignatius, Tertullian, people like that, not only believed in one God, but they believed in a church hierarchy, you know, of bishops and deacons and priests and etc. And it's important to remember, and I always forget this, being a, a modern, you know, progressive, Western progressive or Western liberal, is that we have this luxury called the separation of church and state. And you don't even need it codified in your, your country's constitution to understand that um, in the modern world, we're in a post-faith world, and even if you're a religious believer, which believe it or not I am, I do have religious beliefs, but even if you are a religious believer, oftentimes that, that deity that you worship is put on a shelf for most of the week, only to be taken down once you go to church once a week. That's kind of how it works now, even if you are a, a believer. That's not how it worked in the ancient world. And Elaine Pagels reminds us of that because it's easy to forget that the deity of your particular church is part of the political power structure. It doesn't end with the bishop of your church, priests, deacons, bishop, even king, because there is a deity above the king of, of, your, of whatever region you're at. The, the deity or the god is part of that, that hierarchical structure. They're inseparable. It's not something you take down and worship on Sundays and ignore the rest of the week. It's not a secular world. That deity is part of the power structure that these people believed in. And when you have two such deities, well, that's a separation of powers. And when you have an unstructured church, well, good luck maintaining any control. Especially when you have an Orthodox church who has rules, who has a power structure, and who believes at the top of that power structure a singular almighty deity. At least this is all Elaine Pagel's theory, which I don't think she came up with. Again, she doesn't need Nag Hammadi to come up with this. Uh, these ideas, uh, these theories about how the church began uh, being a power structure from a singular deity have been around for probably centuries. Anyway, here's, here's what Elaine Pagel says. Um, she discusses about, again, uh, the, the, the duality of deities, at least duality of deities that the Gnostic believers believed in, and that they have secret rituals in their church order, and they have rotating uh, people who, who hold these Gnostic um, services, I guess I'll call them. Here's what she says. What this secret tradition reveals is that the one who most Christians naively worship as creator, that is God, and the Father, is in reality only the image of the true God. According to Valentinus, who, Valentinus being a Gnostic theologian, uh, what Clement and Ignatius, that is orthodox um, apologists, mistakenly ascribed to God actually applies only to the creator, the demiurge. Valentinus, who follows Plato, Plato had a lot of these same ideas, um, uses the Greek term for creator, demiurgos, suggesting that he is a lesser divine being who serves as the instrument of the higher powers. It is not God, he explains, but the demiurge, who reigns as king and lord, who acts as a military commander, who gives the law and judges those who violate it. In short, the demiurge is the God of Israel. So the Gnostics believed that the deity of the New Testament, the God of Israel, is, the, is not the true God. He's the, he's the demiurge. He's the blind. He's ignorant. He's the creator of the physical world. He can't help 
but be blind. Whereas um, the Christian apologists believed that the God of Israel said, I am God and there is no other besides me. And all that political power when that God is at the top is centrally focused. So again, it's a focusing, a condensing, a funneling of power through that strict hierarchy that not only just includes a church hierarchy, but a singular uh, divinity at the very top. So kind of a disappointing chapter. Again, these ideas have been around for a very long time. Elaine Pagels did not come up with them, and she really didn't need the Nag Hammadi writings to come up with them. All of this stuff is discussed in early 2nd, 3rd century Christian apologists. Um, not much to discuss. Anyway, um, the next chapter is, that I'll discuss next time, is going to be called, Ooh, God the Father and God the Mother. I haven't touched this chapter yet, but I'll try, I'll discuss it with you next time. Thank you for watching.